My name is Brad McLeod and I work with David Ginger in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Washington. And today I'm going to show you how to uh, perform the external quantum efficiency measurement. External quantum efficiency, or EQE, is a measurement of uh, the number of electrons you can extract from a photovoltaic device per incident uh, number of photons. First of all, we have the lamp source. Inside is, is a lamp and some optics to uh, focus the light into the monochromator. And the monochromator allows us to uh, select certain wavelengths of light to perform our spectral studies. We focus this light with some optics onto, in this case, we're looking at the photodiode that's calibrated so we know how much light is coming out of the source. We have a custom sample chamber that allows us to test our samples under inert atmospheres or under vacuum. From that sample chamber, we have a switch box because the substrates actually have several devices on them and a source probe unit, the Keithley 2400, which is an industry standard for measuring current when we apply voltage. And in order to uh, test our devices under vacuum, we have a rotary vane uh, vacuum pump uh, with a valve that we can turn on and off to load samples. Uh, in addition to that, we have the power supply for the lamp. And these different pieces of hardware are interfaced through our computer via LabVIEW software by National Instruments. In order to accurately determine the external quantum efficiency, we need to measure the photocurrent response of our calibrated diode, and then we'll need to measure the photocurrent response of our device under test. So to do this, we will take the calibrated photodiode, hook it directly into the source probe unit, and we actually have a mask for our photodiode, and what the mask allows us to do is control the illuminated area on the photodiode and why we do this is we want to illuminate the same area on both the diode and the solar cell to get an accurate EQE measurement because we need to ensure that the, the flux of the incident light is equivalent for both measurements. So to measure the, the photocurrent response of the diode, we'll make sure that the lamp is on we might set the monochromator to something, to some wavelength that's easy to observe by eye. So about 532 nanometers uh, will give you a nice visible green spot. And then we adjust back and forth and side to side using our micrometer stage to center the, the beam on our masked off area of the photodiode. And we also have a measurement to, to move this up and down to ensure that it's directly in line with the light. And we'll use the source probe unit to help us achieve the maximal photocurrent uh, by adjusting these positions. And this ensures us that we've aligned the masked area of the photodiode with the peak intensity of, of the lamp. And that should be reproducible whether we're using the, the masked photodiode or a masked test device. We can see that if I move side to side, the current goes down pretty rapidly. This is an easy way for us to, to align things reproducibly by just finding the maximum photocurrent at a given wavelength. So right now, for the, the given monochromator settings of our lamp and the given power settings from our lamp supply, this particular photodiode being masked off to a certain area is giving us 22 microamps. And since we know the, the masked area of our mask, we can determine a photocurrent density as well. To control the experiments, we use a graphical programming language known as LabVIEW, which is produced by National Instruments. This window I, I have open is to uh, measure the photocurrent spectra of a device, and all we really need to do is set the start and stop wavelengths for the scan. This will change the center wavelength of the monochromator and allow us to, to step through different wavelengths. and and measure the current as a function of wavelength. So we set the start wavelength, the finish wavelength, uh, the step size, and any other settings we might want to change to the hardware or the software to improve the sensitivity of the measurement. So right now I have it set to start at 400 nanometers, finish at 800 in steps of 10 nanometers. When the code is executed from the computer, it sends the signal over a standardized uh, communication hardware by the, by the acronyms GPIB. 
which is, is just the standard uh, cable and communication systems that National Instruments uses. And it will instruct the monochrometer to shift the, the grating internally to diffract a certain wavelength of light. And additionally, we also have equipped on our monochrometer order sorting filters. So as we move to lower energy wavelengths, we filter out harmonic components from higher energy harmonics. So I'll just run this scan now. And pick a file name. Uh, this scan will probably take about a minute or two. Not very long. It could take longer if we want to increase the resolution or sensitivity. Now we have a plot of the photocurrent spectra for the calibrated silicon photodiode. So next we, uh, we want to actually test our device. We have a, a 15 millimeter square substrate uh, ITO that we fabricated a device on. You'll see eight little fingers sticking off, four from each side. These are the aluminum top electrodes. You'll see eight little blotches and a ninth large blotch up here. That silver paint that we use to soften the mechanical contact between our test setup and the actual device. So normally when we've made a device and we're getting ready to load it for testing, we do this from inside the glove box. So we've designed this sample holder to be small enough to fit into the antechamber of the glove box system. But for the, for the purposes of demonstration, we'll, we'll just do this on the lab bench. So it's got kind of a tight fit from the seal there. So what you'll notice is we have feed through for the, for the wiring. There's about eight individual wires, one for each pixel that we have on a substrate, plus one wire for the common contact. There's optical access from both sides. In this particular device holder, we have two thumb screws which you just have to turn to loosen and unsecure this plane here. And then you just pull this out. And in this particular device holder, we have push pins. And the idea with this design was that it can be easily manipulated inside the glove box when you, when you have these really thick gloves on. But also, we want to minimize the stress on wires during use so that it has a longer lifetime in operation. Then using our tweezers, we can just pick up this device that was already in there. And then underneath the device, you'll see this mask that was fabricated to mask off the illuminated area of our substrates. You can see that there's eight little slots corresponding with the eight finger-shaped pixels on our substrates. So we replace the mask, make sure it's faced properly. We take our next device, we're gonna place place the device face up uh, so that the mask is touching the glass side of our substrate and the aluminum contacts are facing upward because those parts need to come into contact with our external circuitry. So we want to try to align the pixels with the underlying mask visually before we secure the device, but we can sort of move it around after we've actually secured the device with this back plane. So we just want to make sure that the common electrode here at the top is oriented such that it will hit the spot of silver paint that we've put on the substrate. We just gently put this in, give it a, a slight push down so that we can secure the thumb screws. So you might be able to see that the mask wasn't aligned very well because you can look through it and see completely through to the other side of the device holder. The easiest way to fix this is to hold the sample holder up in front of a light source and adjust the mask until you can't see light coming through it anymore. So now that we have the sample secured in the device holder and the mask is aligned with the eight different pixels, we'll load it into the chamber. We want the device to be normal with one of these four optical access windows. And in our, our particular sample chamber, we have little holes on the lid and a, and a notch on the chamber to make that easy in the case that we want to do normal incidence experiments or even at angle to, of uh, 45 degrees. Just have to make sure that this gets pushed in and the seal is set. And then we take our vacuum system. 
latch it on. And open the vacuum to the chamber. So at this point, our, our device is under vacuum. In, in an, using a, a rotary vane pump, it, it should uh, maintain pressures in the millibar range. We do this to prevent effects from the presence of oxygen and moisture to the degradation of uh, polymers that we use in the devices. So now we'll just place this on our translational stage. Uh, so I'll remove the uh, photo detector. And uh, secure the, the sample chamber in this base. And we just want to make sure by eye that it's that the windows are, are kind of faced off and normal to the incident uh, light that we'll be testing with. And at this point, you'll, you'll notice that this assembly can be kind of top heavy. So it might be a good idea uh, under normal testing conditions to, to secure this somehow and reduce uh, vibrations. So then we have a, a switch box so that we can test the eight different uh, pixels on our substrates. And that just plugs into the feed through on the top of the chamber as so. Then we take the, uh, the BNC cable from the photodiode assembly and plug it onto the switch box. Now we're ready to test the solar cell using the LabVIEW uh, software. We can test one pixel at a time and in order to to test it under lighting conditions we'll have to align it similarly uh, to the way that we aligned the photo detector. Using this technique where we look at the photo current and adjust the micrometer uh, translational stage requires that the device is efficient enough and produces enough photo current. Otherwise you may have to rely on some other kind of signal or just visually aligning it by eye. So I'll go ahead and, and attempt to align pixel 1. So I set the switch box to pixel 1. I turn the source probe unit on to local and output on. And then we get a live display of the current coming out of that device. Now the monochrometer is, is still set to the last setting that we, we programmed um, when we ran the, the photo current spectra for the detector, which ended at 800 nanometers. So right now it's, it's shining light that I can't really see, so I'll have to go set it to something that I can actually observe by eye. So I just pick the, the wavelength, 532 nanometers in this case, and run that program. So we've set the monochrometer to a wavelength that's easily observed by the human eye in the green. And now I'll align pixel number one using the photo current and my visual observations of the beam's position to align the pixel. So right now it's actually off to the side. Uh, so I'll adjust um, this side to side uh, micrometer. It's getting close to the pixel, so I'll look at the photo current uh, for a change. So now that we've found the maximum photo current uh, for pixel one, uh, we'll go ahead and run the LabVIEW photo current spectra measurement to measure photo current as a function of uh, incident wavelength. So now I'll be measuring the photo current spectra of our test device over the same range and same software settings as we use to measure the calibrated photo detector. When this is completed, we can perform the EQE calculation using the photo detector calibration file and the two spectra that we've collected. So you will actually notice uh, something different about this particular device's photo current spectrum and the silicon photo detectors photo current spectrum. The, the photo current spectrum of the device actually peaks in negative current where the, the silicon photo detector peaked in positive current and that's just due to the polarity of the device. We can arbitrarily inverse that or switch the polarity of the test cell to accommodate for that. So now I would take the two photo current spectra, one of our test device and one of the silicon photodiode 
bring that into a spreadsheet with the uh, calibration data for our silicon photodiode. Uh, the calibration data, uh, known as the responsivity, is just a measure of the amount of current that the photo detector produces for a given incident amount of light power. And using these three pieces of data, we can calculate the number of electrons per unit time that our, our test device is producing under illumination at a given wavelength for the number of incident photons on the device per unit time. And it's the ratio of those two that is the EQE. This is my way of doing this calculation. I have a, a spreadsheet template that I just copy and paste the two spectra that I've collected. The responsivity data uh, for this particular diode is already in this file, so I don't have to worry about that. So, copy and paste the photocurrent spectra of the detector to one column. and the photocurrent spectra from the test cell into another column. What we would see from the external quantum efficiency is that it has some spectral peak line shapes and those line shapes are correlated with the absorbing polymer. So the peak efficiency is occurring somewhere near 500 nanometers incident uh, irradiation, which corresponds with the peak absorption of polythiophene. We use the a photocurrent spectrum of the calibrated silicon photodiode and to that we apply the calibration uh, responsivity which gives us the uh, the responsivity is in units of amps per watt so for the amount of photocurrent that we measure it tells us how much uh, power of light was incident on the detector at every wavelength in the spectra so we're able to determine what the power density uh, spectrum is for the lamp system and then when we divide our photocurrent spectrum of the test cell by this power density spectrum we're able to determine directly uh, what the EQE is by knowing how many electrons there is for the uh, the current that we measure. If you're not careful with with the measurement the units are going to be arbitrary but you can still get spectral features. The actual units would just be a percentage zero to one if these were actual units, this, this would be a very poorly performing cell having like 0.1%, uh, 0.2% efficiency. But uh, we can still compare to, uh, the relative performance of devices with relative units, assuming that all the different settings in our setup were identical. The actual external quantum efficiency requires that we pay special attention to things such as how we've defined the active area how much of the active area is illuminated compared to the, its total area, uh, as well as the intensity of the light that we use, the temperature it's tested under, uh, all these different parameters. We have to consider comparing any two absolute values in units that are meaningful. For these particular devices where we have ITO, spin coated with P.PSS, PSS, it's been coated with a bulk heterojunction blend of polyhexyl thiophene and PCBM and some top contact uh, like aluminum. We should expect anywhere from as low as 50% to as high as maybe 80% or more external quantum efficiency at the peak wavelength, which for these devices should be in the, the 500 nanometer range.